Good afternoon, and uh, I'm delighted to be here to share with you what I hope will be some interesting data and insights from citizens around the globe, but also some um, insights from British citizens as well. And what I want to do, we have a lot of data, and so when I'm asked to talk at a presentation like this, it's almost what do we choose to talk about, because there's so much um, to know. But what I want to do is pick up on three themes this afternoon. The first is about ESG silos. So traditionally, we've talked about the environment, social issues and governance as quite different things. So I want to reflect on that. The second is something we hear a lot about when people talk about citizens and consumers with regard to sustainability, and that's the say-do gap, that they say they care, they say they're worried, but they're not acting. And then finally, I want to talk about the um, expectations of citizens and consumers when it comes to business and organisations, and perhaps some challenges and barriers with regard to engaging them. So, let's kick off with the ESG silos. Because in the minds of consumers and citizens, when it comes to business and government, it's not about environment or social, it's about behaving well. And I think more and more this is true, that people don't think, oh, that's a this issue or a that issue. And we need to put ourselves in the minds of the citizens and of the consumers, if they're your, your customers, and think about how do they see things. And they don't see them as E, S and G in the way that we talk about them. So I want to start off with um, a figure, because I'm from Ipsos and that's what we're all about. We're all about the figures. 83% of people think we're heading for an environmental disaster unless we change our behaviour soon. This is across the globe. So this is 25 markets, both developing and emerging economies. So it's not just the developed world. Everybody is concerned. Everyone knows that there's an issue that we need to address. And in fact, when we group the different values that people have, the climate emergency is the number one value that unites the whole planet. So it's real. People are concerned. And this is from last year. Um, so this figure is going to be even higher, given the experience we've had um, over 2022. And it's not surprising this figure is high. Because when we ask people whether they've noticed the impact of climate change, not just in their country, but in the region of their country where they live, the figure is very high. 77% globally, that's three quarters of the world's population, say that they've experienced climate change in their region. And I don't need to tell you, the headlines are full of it. Um, you know, we can't uh, not be upset by what's happening in Pakistan. If we think about the UK, that's half of the UK population totally being displaced from their homes. Just thinking about that for a second, that is very scary. China is experiencing incredible heat waves that have never been seen before. People have died in Spain and Portugal. And, you know, many other things I could keep going. One billion pounds worth of damage in the US with regard to weather that they've experienced. So this is very much real in people's lives. But when we look at the importance of climate change, so in terms of what concerns people, we actually see here that it comes fifth on the list. And that's because people worry about what's happening to them today, tomorrow, next week. They're focused on the things that um, affect their ability to be able to look after their families, to be able to protect them, to provide for them. Uh, yes, it has increased, but actually what we see is that other things like inflation, and we can't, you know, that's in the headlines at the moment. And it's very much about the kind of urgent, the things that affect us today, overtaking the important. But the environment and the issues to do with climate change are not going to go away. And I just want to share this data from, this is only a couple of weeks ago um, from the UK from British, um, actually from mainland Britain, where we ask people spontaneously what their concerns are. And actually you see no surprise that pollution, environment, climate change has shot right up. And we conduct this every month. So it's really interesting to see that the um, 40 degree temperatures that were experienced in several parts of the UK 
have come through and people are thinking, you know, this is really concerning because they can see the impact on their life. They can see how it's affecting them. And these weather events are becoming more, so the environment is more noticeable. Uh, people are more aware of the events. And now we're having lots of rain. I'm sure people... It's almost weird to see rain after so much dry period. But... It's not all about the environment. And when we talk about sustainability, and uh, the previous speaker, James, said, you know, the definition sometimes a bit, you know, what is sustainability? We would say it's about people, planet, and prosperity. It needs to be all three things. Um, so it's not just about the environment. And what was interesting during COVID is that the social issues started rising to the top. So just some examples here of Black Lives Matter, the Me Too movement, and equality for all, the fact that the COVID pandemic seemed to bring women back to more uh, traditional roles and having to, particularly in the developed world, take a lot of this responsibility, not in all cases, but it seemed to uh, disadvantage women more. And this definitely came to the attention of the public and the media, particularly in the developed world. And when we ask people, when it comes to the responsibility of organisations, what they should focus on, whether it be environment, social or governance, just checking the slides moving forward, we actually see that social comes first. So when we ask them about the responsibilities, oh, sorry, slides are a bit slow on there. Uh, yes, we see that actually social comes first at 38% of people saying that's the thing that companies should focus on first, then environment at 36%, and then governance, 26%. And actually, this figure has increased in terms of environment because actually social was quite a way ahead of environment and governance a year ago. So environment and social are very important. But why, therefore, if this is the expectation of what citizens think that businesses and organisations should focus on, are we so focused on the environment? And I think this is really interesting, this idea of planetary health. The fact that citizens are already starting to make the link between the environment and our ability to survive and do well as citizens on this planet. And a couple of people have touched on this um, in earlier presentations. And I really like this figure of 62% of people think the global pandemic that we've had, we're still in it, uh, with regard to COVID, is because a way of kind of the environment fighting back, that it's come about because we've misused the planet. And when you look at some of the science, there's a little bit of truth in that, that we have brought ourselves closer to the uh, kind of wild animals um, that perhaps we wouldn't have touched if we hadn't encroached on territory. So, but I'm just hypothesizing here. But definitely citizens have made this link between our health and our well-being and the health and well-being of the planet. So silo de definitions don't really work anymore when we're talking to people. The second point um, that I want to talk to with regard to the data is about the say-do gap. Um, has anybody heard this term? I'm just going to ask. Yeah, so a few nods, a few nods. Um, and it's easy, isn't it? We do do it because it's... Um, I think there was an example of Reading Festival where I think people were upset and kind of protesting about the state of the environment, the state of things, but then you saw those pictures of the land that was left when people... Uh, left the site. So, you know, this is kind of unfortunately a bit of a uh, typical of human nature. But when we look at whose responsibility it is to do something about this, we, so sorry, I should say in the green bars, this is people who are saying who should act, and then in blue, who is acting. And what you can see is that the responsibility is firmly put on the government and the belief that, you know, actually they're not acting. And the same can be said of private companies, slightly less so. But still, there's a belief that they should be doing more than they are doing. When we turn to ourselves as citizens, we're kind of like, well, we expect we should act. And yeah, we, we're acting, right? We're, we're doing this. We're, we're doing something. Um, so there is a little bit of like, you know, you know we're, we're doing our bit. We're already doing what we say or believe we can be doing. But actually, the public... Uh, are least likely to be making the changes, to be making changes in their behaviour that will have the biggest impact. 
And you can see this here, and we haven't really seen any changes when we've tracked this over the last seven years. So very small increments in terms of behavior um, over uh, a period where the environment has very much been in the headlines. And this is despite seven in 10 saying they know what they need to do across the globe. I know what I need to do. I know, I know how to behave, how to change my behaviors, how to help with climate change. But perhaps the story is more complicated than the say-do gap. So when we ask people which of the actions they think are most important in reducing greenhouse gases, we see this hierarchy. And clearly, recycling stands out there at the top. And I think this is because people feel this is something that they can do something about, that they have some control of. And you can see other things like living car-free or changing to uh, a diet, which is more uh, with lower carbon impact, is lower down. When we compare that to the actual impact, we see that there's actually a fairly poor correlation between what people believe they should do and the actual impact. So they've got recycling there. Actually, of the 60 things, it's the least impactful thing when we compare it to all the other actions that they could take. And you can see clearly that you know, things like living car-free and changing their diet, which would be much more powerful in reducing greenhouse gases, are quite low down. So we talk about this, it's not the say-do gap, it's the believe-true gap. And this highlights the fact that you know, we need to help consumers, we need to help citizens to understand the impact, to become more carbon literate, to have better education, better information, better direction on making choices. Because only when they have that knowledge can they then go, well, actually, I might go on this holiday rather than this holiday, or buy this food product instead of this food product, or choose this energy supplier versus this energy supplier. So it really feels like that's the bigger issue, rather than people saying they care and not acting. And then the last, uh, my third point that I'd like to make is talking about sustainability as a co-benefit, not the benefit. And there was a talk on aviation uh, earlier where they were talking about how much you would have to pay. It'd be 20% more, I think, for more sustainable flights. And then when you ask people, they're like, oh yeah, you know, I'd play for more sustainable. But then when it comes to the kind of hard choice that that sometimes softens a little bit. So I just want to use an example of kind of product and service innovation to kind of highlight this need for sustainability to be a co-benefit rather than the benefit in the minds of consumers. So when companies are innovating with products, we know from other research data, from databases that we have, that products will do better in markets when they are highly differentiated, so they're, different, they're offering something different than their competitors, and also when they have high relevance. And if they have both of these things, they will do significantly better. And the rules are no different for sustainable products. They still need to be relevant, and they still need to be differentiated. It's not that adding sustainability on will suddenly allow you to gain, gain greater market share. Um, so this is kind of important to acknowledge. And we actually see this in lots of other areas like communications um, and to do with customer experience is that people expect the organizations to be taking the initiative, um, but they still need to tick all of the other boxes that are there. Um, and so while most agree that, yes, we need to do something, we need to change our behaviors and perhaps buy products and services that are more sustainable, um, we know that um, actually that not everyone cares to the same extent. So we're not all a homogenous group of citizens or consumers. We have our different priorities, our different personal situations, which affect how engaged we are um, with sustainability. And I don't have the time to go through this in a huge amount of detail, but if you are interested, we can share some more information afterwards. But we did an environmental segmentation across 16 markets, and there were some developing and emerging economies, so there are differences across the markets, of course. But broadly, we found these five segments. So activists, which are about 17%, these are people who are truly willing to put themselves out, to potentially pay more, um, and they like to be making some of those bigger changes. So living car-free, using public transport, um, having a more either vegetarian or vegan diet. They tend to be just a slight bias towards being more female 
and younger. So these are what we call the more activist segment. They're actually making quite significant changes in the terms of their lifestyle choices. We then have the pragmatists, and these are slightly older, uh, slightly better off, and this has been talked about before, and some knowing faces there, which are quite a big group of about 30%, and they're more likely to be making more of the everyday, so they will be looking for more uh, packaging that will recycle, they will be looking for products where, um, you know, they're better for the environment, better tick more of the social boxes as well. But they tend to be smaller kind of things that can be done at home. So light bulbs, um, you know, turning down the heating, uh, recycling, composting, all of those kind of behaviours. We then have the conflicted contributors. So they do have a level of concern for the environment, but cost is a real issue for them. And this is going to be even more so with inflation. So we, we are tracking these segments and we're seeing the changes in the size of them every quarter. Um, and so that is a major barrier for them. Not that they're not worried and they're not willing to act, but cost is predominantly the barrier for them. And then skeptics, they are less concerned. They're a little bit like, mm, is it really such an issue? Is it, is it really such the problem that we think it is? But actually, they're still engaged with changing their behaviour. But this segment are much more about if it's difficult or um, I have to change my behaviour significantly, then I'm not sure I can do it. So they're very much about frictionless convenience, it not affecting the way that they do things. I'm busy, I haven't got time. This is very much... Uh, characterizes this segment. So it's about how can we remove the friction for this segment. And then finally we have disengaged denialists. And this is actually probably two little segments. One that are just like a little bit like this is just not happening. It, I think it's overblown. I don't believe that it's going on. And this segment will change. Um, and then also people who are like it doesn't affect me. It's not my problem. So there's different levels of engagement and it's necessary to understand this kind of nuance if we're going to help um, people change. So different behavioural interventions, different information that they want, want and how we deliver products and services or experiences um, to fit in with these different identities. And what we look at when we come to willingness to pay, we really only see that it's the activists who are Yes, I will put my money and I will spend. So it's quite a small segment. Pragmatists and skeptics, yes, they're interested and they're open, but they have their own complexities. But conflicted, contribu conflicted contributors and deniers are going to be slightly harder. Not that they won't, but you're going to need to use slightly different uh, dynamics to engage them. And I wanted to uh, share an example, and this is only one sector, one category. Um, but we did um, a trial, this is a, we've just repeated it recently, where we had a kind of hypothetical retail online store where we presented dishwash liqui liquid and people could choose what they wanted. And we presented this product, Sustain, with and without an environmental claim and at parity price points to the main market and two other price points. And people were allowed to shop um, on this site and... We had different cells for the different sustained products at different prices. And what we saw was when we had no claim versus a sustainable claim, at price parity, significant increase in those choosing the sustained product. So sustainability, all things being equal, will make the sustainable choice. People do are and are engaged in sustainability. When we increase the price, we see... Um, you know, when we're like a dollar more expensive, that's lost. So whether you've got the claim or not, you're back to the equivalence of no claim. So people are not generally willing to pay a price premium, or if they are, it's going to be quite a small price premium. And this has been echoed in previous presentations about the aviation, and I've heard other examples this afternoon. So what we do know is that all things being equal, people will make um, the more sustainable choice. So I wanted to come back and touch on each of these points in summing up. So the first is that the, we know that there's concern for the climate. People are worried and I'm sure people who weren't worried, having experienced the weather particularly over the last year in this country, 
we'll be more kind of cognizant of actually this is perhaps more of a thing than I thought it was. And people who've been on holiday stuck in trains with fire around them, which has happened to uh, friends of mine and people travelling to other countries are like, yeah, things are definitely changing. I can, I can feel the change happening. But it's not all about the environment. And there is an expectation from people that organisations and businesses attend not just to the environment, but also to the social issues as well. And one of the dangers that we do see, and I, I don't want to pick out any single brand, but there are some good examples, um, where there's been a great initiative on environment. And the company's done some really clever things, um, some really great communications campaign. No greenwashing, they're actually doing it. Um, it's landed well, and people have liked the advertising, they've liked the product. But then there were whistleblowers who say it's an absolutely toxic workplace. There's high levels of discrimination. People have been let go for no good reason. This is a really bad place to be where you're playing in one area and then not looking after the other area. So when citizens think about companies, they think about when we, we talk about sustainability in ESG, it's about behaving well. You know, if the company, um, terrible things have happened in the company and they've lost money and then yet there's, uh, people are getting huge bonuses, people won't like that either. So we need to be careful, I think, uh, to treat environment, social and governance when we're business and organisations in these silos. Secondly, we see from that data that citizens already think they're doing enough. They think that they're doing their bit or they're doing what they can do. And we even see in some ethnography that people are saying, but it's impossible. I'm just one human being. How can I make a difference? Um, and there was a great presentation in stage two just before the lunch break um, where, it, where it's that role of kind of helping people understand the implications of what they do. So it's not the say, do, act. There is a role for education and you know, the role of helping people with behavior change. But, but in the way that we can tell, we've got kind of financial understanding of how much things cost, we need to start opening up what the carbon cost is, uh, the decisions that we make, of the behaviours, and linking these. And there's also good discussion in the UK about labelling and linking health labelling with carbon labelling. And then you're bringing again the E and the S together so that people can make informed choices about both their own health and the health of the environment. And then final, finally, we do see a lot of like, well, we can charge a premium because it's sustainable or we can charge more because it's sustainable. Now, the onus is being put on government and business to act, not on the individual. So there is this expectation that sustainability is expected to be delivered as a co-benefit rather than the benefit. So in most cases, um, it's not an opportunity to necessarily charge more for things. Um, it may change over time as people become more concerned, but generally what we see is that people want sustainability delivered as a co-benefit, not their benefit. And if you can deliver it alongside other differentiating factors, um, I could use Octopus Energy, for example, who have amazing customer service and are sustainable and, and, and deliver all the things that people are expecting, then um, that is, all things being equal, people will definitely make that choice. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pippa. Um, if any questions, oh, didn't even have to finish my sentence. If we can get the microphone up towards the back, please, Tom. In the meantime, I've got a question here. Um, I was just looking at your slides there, and bear in mind they are mirrored in the back there, but I was trying to read the, the figures. And am I right in saying that conflicted and denialists added up to around a third of those surveyed when you combine them? Yeah, they do. And so right. that is a concern, but actually there's a lot of nuance um, I, can't, I couldn't present all the detail between yeah. the segments, but they're not kind of lost. It's not like they're hopeless and, and that we can't engage them. And there's lots of nuance about their willingness to support local things versus some people expect more action from government versus community-based projects. So there are different ways. There's more complexity behind that about how businesses and organisations can think about how they engage even those groups that look like perhaps they don't care so much or not so willing to act. Yeah, I mean, that's what I was going to um, ask, actually, in talking about nuance. Um, do you see any differences between different age, gr age groups or generations in terms of concern for the environment and climate change? Yeah, we, I mean, we saw a little bit with the segments that the activists tend to be um, younger. And what we do see in the data is that younger people, so we're talking about 
Generation Z, uh, or the Zoomers, as some people call them, uh, they're more likely to protest, they're more likely to sign petitions, they're more likely to boycott brands who are seen to be doing the wrong thing. So they're, they're kind of putting their money or putting their choices um, you know, against those things. But we have that big segment, almost a third, who tend to be older and have the money as well. So we do see some differences, but we're doing a lot of work on generations and sustainability in generations is a big question that people ask. What we see is quite a lot of polarization, I would say. We're starting to see that with the Gen Z, and there is some fatalism. Um, there's definitely um, a, a segment within that segment who are, it's too late, it's messed up. And, you know, it's really important that I think that we <laughs> rescue those and say, no, it's not too late. And, uh, and interesting in that chart about whose responsibility, the young put more expectation in the NGOs and science, which is quite interesting that they're going to be the ones who um, help make the difference. Okay. Uh, so we'll take your question. Just state uh, who you are and where you're from, please. Thank you very much. Uh, Kate Grafer, I'm an associate with Nova K Procurement Solutions. Uh, thank you very much um, for, this, for, for your talk today. Um, really insightful. One of my question really was around, um, I agree with the comment about education. Um, I think there's definitely more needed for uh, public and across industry. Uh, my, my point really is as much about the, the data um, as you say, when you get stories such as Google changing its carbon calculator for flights and given that there is so much data out there and issues with standards, how we might approach data so that people um, actually believe what we're saying rather than finding an alternative or a different perspective which feels like it's a barrier at the moment. Yeah, it, it's a really good question because even uh, discussing with our neighbours, we now have four recycling bins or four bins and the, only the main rubbish is collected every three weeks. And you're like, what's going on? Um, and people are like, I think it goes to landfill anyway. So that, you know, that trust. And we are doing some work on trust for different sectors and with, when it comes to sustainability. But yeah, it's a huge, it's a huge challenge. A putting information in a format that people can understand in enough detail. And we've been through that with nutritional labelling for the last, I don't know, 25 years, 30 years. How do we provide people with information in a way that they can digest? Oh, sorry, that's a... Uh, but digest it and to help them make the right choices. And I think with carbon, it's going to be as challenging uh, to be able to put it in, in context. But there are brands who are already trying to put carbon and making comparisons. Um, the advertising standards obviously is a challenge to some of those companies because it needs to be, you know, needs to be good science. So with advertising, at least, there are some good standards on checking that the information is correct to try and get rid of the greenwashing. There's been lots of stamping down. So that's, in terms of communication through advertising with brands, I think there's hope there. Um, we are doing some work on climate literacy in schools um, with an organisation. The data will be out in a couple of weeks. Um, that's really important as well. It needs to be from the ground up in the same way that the nutritional education... Um, you know, I had my kids bringing stuff home and going, we, we shouldn't have this or we shouldn't do that. or we, you know, you shouldn't. The, when they start coming home and telling you, and my, my, my son brings his recycling home because they don't have a bin at his college, um, and I open his bag and it's full of like unwashed plastic bottles, I'm like, oh, my goodness. Um, but, but yes, we need to get that enthusiasm and energy from, from the bottom up as well. But it's, with trust is always an issue with anything. Um, so perhaps that's why the youth are saying the scientists need to help us with um, you know, how we not only create the solutions, but also how we help communicate them, perhaps through education. Okay, thank you for your question. If there are any more questions for Pippa, please reach out to her directly via her email, which you can see on the screen. Uh, thank you very much, Pippa, for the thank presentation. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.